the Spot Track Podcast, talking sports contracts, the salary cap, and business of sports. Welcome to another edition of the Spot Track Podcast. My name is Mike Gennetti. It is Monday, January 29th. Championship week is behind us. That is, of course, the focus today. Not so much the analysis and the fourth downs and the field goals and the X's and O's, of course, but the where do they go from here conversation. And we're going to skip ahead. We're going to... We're going to take all four of these teams and treat them like off-season candidates right now, even though only two are. Of course, we're talking about the Ravens, Lions, 49ers, and Chiefs, and dive deep. Notable free agents, potential cap space, cap clearing possibilities, some extension candidates, and some storylines to build as we approach March 13th and franchise tag window and all that fun stuff that's coming right around the corner, really right after Super Bowl finishes off on February 11th. I'm going to start with the Baltimore Ravens. I realize that the sky is falling right now. I realize that Lamar kind of reverted back to playoff Lamar a little bit here, if you want to coin that phrase. I'm here to tell you that things are going to be just fine with this organization. The majority of this starting lineup is nicely under contract. There are plenty of ways for this team to load up on cap space. They're basically cap neutral. If we factor in a bunch of reserve contracts coming off the practice squad here in the next couple of days. So there's work to be done. You got to free yourself up 30 to 40 million. There's plenty of ways to do that. There are certainly some notable free agents. I'm not going to sit here and say that it's not a, you know, at least a situation you have to monitor, right? Jadavian Clowney had a nice year. Justin Matabuke is probably getting a franchise tag. And if not, he's going to be the one the one you have to really work on. All right. Because he had himself a career year in a walk year. That's never a good recipe for financial value. But that's a player you have to really dive in on here. And then, of course, Patrick Queen, the number two now next to Roquan Smith, who absolutely flourished in every role possible. I think he's officially priced himself out of Baltimore because he's a calculation value of 18 and a half million. I, I don't see why a team wouldn't bring him in to, with on the Tremaine Edmonds contract and make him the center and the captain of your, your defense. You know, this is a Detroit landing spot who has a plethora of cap space and needs this kind of leader on, on their defensive. Now, maybe it's a bad fit X's and O's wise, but th- that's the type of impact player Patrick Queen has proven he can be. I think he's priced himself out of Baltimore. Huge top free agent to hit the open market. Geno Smith, Ronald Darby in the secondary, both really strong players. Geno Stone had, Geno Stone, I think I said Geno Smith. Geno Stone had seven interceptions, bit of an anomaly, but certainly something you want to hang your hat on as you're looking for your next contract on the open market. And then the running back situation. Gus Edwards, J.K. Dobbins, both pending free agents. Justice Hill showed some flashes. Keaton Mitchell looks like he's going to be a real you know, a home run threat if he can return to full health. But that's an area where you're drafting top 100, most likely. You know, you're probably drafting some O-line depth, maybe an edge rusher, maybe somebody to replace Matabuke if you don't want to pay him. And then probably, you know, a fourth or fifth round off-ball linebacker and somewhere in there, a versatile running back to try to take another stab at the J.K. Dobbins situation, which unfortunately from an injury standpoint did not work out couple of ways they can open up cap space here. Uh, cap conversions on Lamar, Mark Andrews, Ronnie Stanley, Marcus Williams, maybe an extension for a player like Morgan, Morgan Moses. Uh, Odell Beckham Jr. has $11 million of voided dead cap because of his void years. Is there, is there a small extension there to keep him attached to Lamar, even though it really wasn't a factor here down the stretch, just to lower that cap hit and keep a depth wide receiver in, in tow? It's possible. It's possible, although I, I would imagine... A player like that would want to be upgraded. Um, and that's it. A couple of releases you can make here. Maybe a Tyus Bowser, maybe a Patrick McCarry, because his, his position has essentially been usurped and you can free up four million of cap space by moving on. But I've done an off-season analysis for every single one of these teams now, all 32. This is somewhere near the bottom of complications, all right? Tough decisions. Uh, some money has to get thrown out here for sure. You know, you're going to, you're going to try to talk Patrick Queen's contract down, but like I said, I think that one's already gone, but I I don't know why you wouldn't run this team back for the most part. And I realized they didn't get to the result they wanted to, not even close here in terms of stacking up against the chiefs and then getting themselves into the Super Bowl. But there's not much room for panic here, right? There's a lot of youth. The Zay flower stuff is going to get talked about 
That's a rookie. All right. That, that's a rookie that just learned a ton of lessons yesterday. He's also an absolute stud and somebody that Lamar Jackson has not had in his career. So I look at that as a positive. He's going to get over that. He's going to get talked to. He's going to get slapped on the wrist. He may get fined internally, all the good stuff, right? He's also going to be back next year, as will likely, as will Andrews, as will a lot of this talent, you know, and a strong veteran experienced offensive line. So arrow up on this Baltimore team, even coming off, like I said, a sky is falling situation yesterday against Patrick Mahomes, who is more and more every day proving to us that he is a one of one, at least in this generation. So ways to clear up cap space, not too many big extension conversations this off season, you know, like the one that drove last year, a big $260 million one for Lamar. That looks great right now. Kind of simple stuff. Convert some cap, maybe let a few guys walk. Going to have a defensive line conversation for sure. Probably have to flip over the running back conversation a little bit here. That's it. That's it. That's Baltimore in 2024. They should be with the coaching staff they have. They may lose their defensive coordinator, by the way, too. So that's worth talking about. But they should be right back in this conversation in championship weekend next year if all of these cards play out as they want it to. Detroit. The other unfortunate loser this weekend. And boy, unfortunate is the word, right? Had them, had them where they wanted them. And just completely, I don't know if they got outplayed, uh, outcoached. There's a lot of ways to look at it. I'll let the X's and O's guys do much more work on that. But here's the thing with Detroit. It's a very different conversation than the one I just gave you about Baltimore. A, they're walking into the offseason with about $61 million of top 51 cap space. Now, that's without reserve contracts, and that's with only about 35 players, 34 players actually under contract in 2024. So pause a little bit on $61 million, all right? At least a little bit. But it's there for now. The other reason to pause on cap space and running this thing back is there are four blockbuster extensions waiting for this front office. A front office, by the way, that should get full marks for 2023, 2022, and 2021. The drafts have been outstanding. They're in this position because of drafts and because of a savvy acquisition where they flip Matthew Stafford for Jared Goff. That's why they're here. There's no question about that. So this is a front office I would trust, but in doing so, they have four players in four power positions that probably can't be passed on this offseason. That's Jared Goff at the quarterback spot. That's St. Brown, your, your number one wide receiver. That's Taylor Decker, your left tackle. And that's Penny Suell, your right tackle. Suell's got year four and a fifth year option left. So of the group, I would say that's the one you may be able to push, maybe. But knowing the agents, Knowing how well this player just played, knowing the all-pro status this player just earned, I don't know why agent won't won't back down would back down and say, "Sure, we'll wait, no big deal." All right? He's going to need a top of the market right tackle contract. Taylor Decker, he might have some leeway with, and right, he just earned himself sixty million or you know fifty six and change on his sophomore extension, so this would be contract three for an almost thirty one year old left tackle. You may be able to knock a few million off here and there. But probably not, all right? Because the best way to, to preserve a brand new quarterback contract, and Jared Goff's going to get a big one, is to make sure that his bookend tackles are, prop, are happy and well-paid. So that's where we're headed here this offseason. And by the way, I know that St. Brown is a fantasy darling. I know that many of you know him as a player that has shown flashes of being a true number one. If that's all you know him as, you need to look at his stats. <laughs> Okay, you need to understand just what this player is and has been for Detroit as they've grown into this big boy status. All right. From a calculation standpoint, from a mathematical standpoint, Amon Ross St. Brown is in a better spot financially than AJ Brown was when he was going through his Titans slash Philadelphia turmoil for his next contract. Right. Way better, actually. Okay. 
It's ahead of DK Metcalf. It's ahead of Terry McLaurin. It's ahead of DJ Moore. It's ahead of AJ Brown. He's in CD Lamb territory, right? Now, Lamb is in the 28th, and it's probably going north of 30. Justin Jefferson, certainly going north of 30. Jamar Chase, probably up there with all these, these names. St. Brown is now your next tier of sophomore extensions. He's going to surpass AJ Brown because the numbers say he has to. And he's a true number one. So take a moment, understand what this guy is and understand what it means for Detroit to have a player like this. All right, this is the player that Detroit has had trouble acquiring, right? Free agency, trades, etc. Now they got him out of the fourth round. All right. He's entering a walk year in 2024, set to make a million dollars. They're going to have to do right by this guy. So again, the golf conversation is interesting. The last time this happened, the last time he took a team basically this far enough, certainly the Rams went into the Super Bowl and then lost. So one step further, he scored the most guarantees in the history of football at that time. All right, that's what Les Snead paid him. I don't think Jared Goff is going to bag 220 million guaranteed, which is what it would take to do that this time around. But if you're telling me that he's getting 45 to 50 million a year and that three or four of those years are practically guaranteed. So we're in the 180 to 200 million range of guarantees. I'd have to believe it. I'd have to believe it. Um, he's only 29 going on 30. So it feels like he's been around forever, but he is age appropriate for this next contract, for this third contract. Everything kind of makes sense. Now, mathematically, he is not a $50 million player. He's just not. He just doesn't have the two-year pedigree to, to make the math work out, to even match you know, what Stafford has garnered. Essentially, he has Derek Carr's value from a mathematical standpoint, $37.5 million. Well, Derek Carr ain't in the NFC Championship game, okay? <laughs> and Derek Carr hasn't lifted a lowly franchise to great, great heights a year earlier than I think we all expected. If we're doing this by the book, 2024 should be the prime year for the Detroit Lions. They have the cap. They have the draft assets. They have the quarterback. They have an improving defense and, a, and a, I think a coaching staff that is willing to go above and beyond and maybe a front office as well, right? Just to acquire whether it's one of the big dog free agents, Chris Jones, Patrick Queen, or utilize these draft picks to go all defensive side of the ball this time around because they can afford to do that. They really can't. Their offensive free agents are not notable. Um, it's mostly depth pieces. It's just going to be about handing out a bag of cash. All right. So whatever golf costs you, whatever St. Brown costs you and your bookend tackles, that's going to drive the conversation this off season. It's not going to be about massive turnover. It's just not. This roster is primed and ready. As you saw week after week, they didn't let us down. There were some decision makings yesterday that I know everybody's going to question. But live and learn. They're going to lose their offensive coordinator. That's going to happen. So we've seen teams fall on their face after that's happened. Buffalo, right? We've seen it happen. So that's a big part of this conversation as well. And can we make sure that the next guy in, in that seat can make this Jared Goff, Jamar Gibbs, St. Brown, Jamison Williams, Sam Laporta situation work as well as it's been working? I would think so. But you never know. You know, sometimes you catch lightning in a bottle and you can't recreate it for another decade. The point is this. I don't think anybody's going to screw around with this organization. Pay the players that need to be paid, retain the players that need to be retained, and make some big swings in the draft and via trade or free agency on the defensive side of the ball and set yourself up for an NFC where you should be able to be a top three candidate just by existing, just by being who you are right now. So it's about the money. It's about what, what these extensions look like this offseason in Detroit, more so than how can we improve or how can we change this and change that. And it's about the money. So this is one of those teams I'll be monitoring from my standpoint, from my seat, about as closely as any team in football this offseason. Let's go to the winners. The Kansas City Chiefs are back. Patrick Mahomes is a freak <laughs> in, in the most endearing way possible. Travis Kelsey showed up when he needed to show up these past couple of weeks, as you knew he was going to. You know, this is not an 18 week player. This is not a 21 week player. And now he's head, heading into week 22. 
looking about as good as he has all season. And that's just how these players operate. You know, you don't bet against Steve Spagnola and you read Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey when it comes down to it. I'm not going to focus on these guys too much. I'll give you a one Mahomes stat. If he wins this Super Bowl, he adds $1.25 million to his next year's salary. That He's got an annual escalator built in for that. So the rich getting richer, right? If he wins it, his, his uh, compensation next year jumps to about $46.5 million after making almost $60 million this year after all the incentives and the restructure kicked in. So he's properly compensated, finally, after signing that god-awful extension that I just couldn't... Have, it was going to get outpriced in three years. It got outpriced in two. So I'm happy that the Chiefs played ball and handed him this, this four-year bumper, essentially. 2027 is when he'll have to talk about things again. But properly compensated, Patrick Mahomes can add $1.25 million next year if he wins the Super Bowl. Chris Jones, by the way, added an extra million dollars yesterday by advancing to the Super Bowl, which means he earned $4.25 million of his possible $6.75 million incentives. The Chiefs will get credited $2.5 million on their cap next year because of the incentives that were not earned by Chris Jones. And uh, I guess if we're having a small conversation there, that means he made $22.6 million this year, Chris Jones, after an unsuccessful holdout, after attempting to earn a $30 million per year extension. We're right back where we started. There's a 33 and change franchise tag for Chris Jones that's probably not coming because the Chiefs just won't be doing that to their salary cap in February. Which means it's either somebody breaks and an extension is done before March 13th or everybody's number one overall free agent, including ours. And there's a new analysis tab on the free agent tracker on spotrack.com where I note my top 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 free agents eventually when I get to it. But there's 40 there for now. Chris Jones is number one and he's number one everywhere for a reason because we all think he might get there. If the Chiefs don't bend and give him $30 million a year, and he doesn't bend and accept 26 27 a year, he's going to be available on March 13th. And somebody like the, like the Detroit Lions, I can tell you right now, okay, are going to be sitting there waiting to make an offer that it looks a hell of a lot better than anything the Chiefs have offered. I'm not knocking the Chiefs. I understand this is how contenders have to work. They have to ask for team friendly to keep this band together. But Chris Jones has done way too much now to rightfully accept anything lower than $30 million a year. If he wants to stay with the Chiefs forever and take less, make sure it's fully guaranteed. That's my cap assessment for Chris Jones. But you are a $30 million player. If Nick Bosa is a $34 million player, Chris Jones is certainly a $30 million player. Let's put it that way. Certainly something to watch. One more Chiefs comment. Legereus Need, you should have known about him because he's done everything for three years. Now I know you know about him because of the way he knocked that ball out of Zay, Zay Flowers' hands at the goal line. All right. National pedigree officially, officially earned yesterday. This guy is a safety playing cornerback, a ball hawk who can also cover. Probably not the best cornerback on this roster, right? When you're talking about Trent McDuffie, which means he's probably getting number two wide receivers a lot, which affords him the ability to be outstanding in coverage and also force fumbles and sack players and garner 100 tackles and stop the run. He's a do-everything player. And I think yesterday was the nail in the coffin of him officially pricing himself out of Kansas City, right? Because just from a mathematical standpoint, he is a $16 million cornerback in our system. And again, He's not a number one on his team. So if he comes, if, if he's brought into an organization to be a number one, you're talking about a $20 million contract. It's just going right now for a top of the market free agent cornerback. So that's a big loss. That's, an, that's, an, that's a hole that the Kansas City Chiefs will need to address immediately because he was not just a shutdown corner. He was a do everything defensive back. And I do officially think he has been priced out of Kansas City for 2024 and beyond. So something to watch there for sure. From a cap standpoint, uh, the Chiefs have a little bit of room right now, but the reserve contract should knock that down to about 15 million. But buyer beware. All right, there's 30 some rostered contracts here. You need to get to 90. So they don't have a plethora of contracts, excuse me, a plethora of cap space to get to. However, there's a Juwan Taylor conversion. There's a Joe Tooney conversion. There's a Travis Kelsey conversion. 
You're probably moving on from MVS, even though he's finally reared his, his face the past couple of games here, at least for one or two plays. There's a Justin Reed conversion. There's a lot of work you can do here. All right. You're moving on from Tony in some fashion. You're moving on from a couple of these wide receivers in some fashion. So for the most part, this Chiefs organization is going to look just like it does in 2024. There's a lot of run it back mode. Pacheco, by the way, can't be extended until after 2024. That's one of those names I hear a lot out there. Can't be touched. But for the most part, this Chiefs team is going to be back in our lives again. And if you're sick of it, I would uh, cover your eyes because this is a legitimate dynasty, something I didn't think we'd ever have again in, the, in football, certainly this quickly after the Patriots just finished theirs. But that's what this is, right? This is absolute domination in the harder conference. Yeah. The, the NFC by far has been the depleted conference when you're talking about total teams that can actually win a Super Bowl, total teams that are worth being talked about as a top three, top four. You know, the AFC has consistently had five or six teams bouncing around for the number one seed. There was a world a month and a half ago where the Jacksonville Jaguars were playing for the number one seed in the AFC. They didn't make the postseason. So that's what this conference is right now. And Burrow will be healthy next year. And Herbert will have Jim Harbaugh next year. Okay, Josh Allen may have an actual number two wide receiver next year. Everybody's going to improve. And I wouldn't bet against this guy. Because he has shown every which way with outstanding weapons, with maybe bottom of the barrel weapons, that he just makes it work. So as long as Travis Kelsey's back in this roster next year, even in some capacity, this is going to be the favorite in the AFC, no matter what kind of acquisitions Cincinnati, Buffalo, Baltimore make this offseason to try to bolster their chances to take down the king, who is clearly Patrick Mahomes at this point in time. San Francisco. You want to talk about deep rosters that don't have to do much next year? That would be the theme for the 49ers. Now they will, because every single offseason, they make one move, whether it's a free agent move, whether it's a trade, whether it's a release, that just blows us off, blows us away, right? I think this past year, it was Javon Hargave's contract, a player who was leaving Pittsburgh. Everybody had him penciled into these bad teams on this overpaid contract that was just going to look great from a monetary standpoint, but he was going to get lost in translation. Well, all he did was go four for 84 with maybe the best defense in all of football, right? That's what he did. So something's going to happen that's going to absolutely shock us in San Francisco. And they'll have that ability because Brock Purdy, of course, I'll say it again, cannot be extended until after 2024. He's going to play on the league minimum 985 next year. That's 985,000. And then we get to talking about an extension for Brock Purdy, maybe. But that is the conversation for next year. The one for this year has to do with Brandon Ayuk, um, a player who has gotten better every single year, culminating with this past season, his fourth year out of five. 1,300 yards receiving. Seven touchdowns. The drops were way down. He's caught 75 of 105 targets. One of PFF's top rated wide receivers in all of football. And he's the number two on this roster. And really, you might consider him the number three behind McCaffrey and Debo Samuel. And I think in a perfect world, maybe in a snow globe, George Kittle's neck and neck with them in terms of weapons, in terms of trust, in terms of capabilities. That's what San Francisco has done here. Ayuki is entering year five. It's a 14.1 Miller full t for fully guaranteed fifth year option. So the cap hit and the cash hit are a bit high. What do you do with it? Do you let it ride? Do you convert it to a signing bonus for cap purposes, but keep him a 2025 free agent? Or do you offer him an extension? Which means you now have Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk under contract under big bucks, right? Because Ayuk's a $23 million player in our system. Do you buck the trend, which is we cannot have more than one high price wide receiver? Some teams are trying to go that route. We'll see what the Dolphins do with Waddle and, Ty and Tyreek Hill. We'll see what the Cincinnati Bengals do with having to pay Chase and Higgins here. There's teams trying to go this route. We saw Mike Evans and Chris Godwin live in unity. We saw Mike Williams and Keenan Allen kind of <clears throat> operate together on big contracts. Will San Francisco go this route or will they slow play Ayuk through the fifth year option? 
and then make him a pending free agent in 2025 and certainly a franchise tag candidate based on how he's playing. Something to monitor for sure, because quite frankly, there are not much more things to monitor on this roster. Okay, there are plenty of ways for this team to free up cap space, plenty. And I've listed that in the offseason piece for the NFC West. <clears throat> you know, Debo conversion, Trent Williams conversion, Eric Armstead conversion, Fred Warner conversion, IU conversion, George Kittle conversion, extend Shavarius Ward because he's worth it. McCaffrey conversion, possibly even extension. Hargrave conversion. Okay. All that's on the table here, and all of that can free up dozens of dollars in cap dollars. So if I'm telling you they might be about $15 million under in the negatives when we're talking about reserve future contracts being signed, they can easily free up $50 million with five or six conversions, cap conversions, and be on their way. So again, this is a team that can make a splash when they want to. In any regard, and maybe that's bringing back Chase Young. Maybe that's going and signing some other, you know, top of the line edge rusher. Maybe it's fortifying that secondary a little bit more. Maybe it's, you know, a high draft pick that's going to eventually replace Brandon Ayuk. Maybe it's a big time extension for Christian McCaffrey that we didn't see coming at his age. Can we talk about that quickly? Uh, the fact that Christian McCaffrey has now played two full seasons in a row is one of the most enjoyable, pleasurable things that has happened in the NFL. And I hope that's getting talked about more and not just here. I really do. All right. Because this guy's bugaboo was injuries. And he had two straight years, 2020 and 2021, where he played a combined 10 games. So we get it. There was a huge bad stretch there. And then he went to San Francisco and San Francisco had an offensive line worthy of Christian McCaffrey a play caller worthy of Christian McCaffrey and a bunch of wide receivers and tight ends that know how to block when McCaffrey gets to that second level, which is where he was getting injured, right? That's where he was getting his, his dings. So he's just in the perfect situation. All right. He played 17 games last year. He played 16 games this year and he only missed one because everybody skipped game 17 because they afforded themselves that opportunity. <clears throat> he's been absolutely phenomenal. Okay. Another season of 2000 plus yards from scrimmage, 21 total touchdowns, 67 receptions, and a career best 5.4 yards per attempt in terms of rushing. He played 80% of the snaps, top five PFF running back. He's 27 going on 28 years old. All right. It's just a, this is the reason they're in the Super Bowl. Brock Purdy has said it a bunch of times in front of a microphone and, and it, you have to believe this. This is the MVP of this team, right? This is the guy that does everything. He's the guy that bridges the run game with the passing game, literally, like physically does that himself. <laughs> he is the reason Debo Samuel can operate. Otherwise, Debo would just be a one-trick gadget. He'd be the only player that anybody would have to monitor. He's the reason San Francisco has been successful over the past two seasons. He's the reason in the Super Bowl this year. And the roster construction and the play calling is the reason that he has, he has been able to stay healthy, truly. So it's just a better league when this guy's playing 17 weeks, now 22 weeks, and uh, he, get, he deserves full marks. He carries a $14 million cap at next year. He's got two for 24 and change left on this contract. If you want to tell me that they blow it up and start over, give him a nice signing bonus and start fresh, I, who's going to complain with that? All right, We want more, not less of Christian McCaffrey. So if it, makes, if it works for your cap... And your cash flow to hand this guy a brand new contract and rip up the last two years of this current one, that's perfectly fine with all of us. All right, San Francisco, do what you got to do. Just keep this guy healthy because obviously you win games when that happens. But fantasy owners, television viewers, primetime networks just are better when Christian McCaffrey scores a touchdown every single week. And that's exactly what's happening right now in the modern NFL. Um, this team's coming back largely. They're going to be the betting favorites. Regardless of what happens next week, they're going to be the betting favorites in the NFC. They may be the betting favorites in all of football, although I wouldn't bet against Patrick Mahomes, as I've said again. And they're going to make a big splash. So predicting what that big splash is going to be, it's going to be one of my fun homer projects for the next couple of weeks. But by and large, San Francisco and Baltimore are going to look a hell of a lot the same. Detroit's got some big-time money to work on. And I would expect a couple of upgrades defensively there. And the Chiefs have a lot of work, in my opinion. 
right? You've got to replace or pay Chris Jones. You've got a secondary situation brewing. Certainly some weapons, all right? And maybe an offensive lineman or two that are going to need some help. But San Francisco and Baltimore, if you are fans that monitor their cap situations, A, both are in nice shape, especially after cap conversions. And B, I would expect, for the most part, that they would be near the top of the betting favorites based on what this team is going to look like in 2024. So it's all about who's going to get extended. So what's on spottrek.com right now? Okay. A couple of NBA things to get to off the top here. A, the trade deadline's February 8th. Keith Smith has pieces up. Uh, he's done the Eastern Conference detail, buyers and sellers, and all of his predictions. The Western Conference is forthcoming. But more importantly, we have launched a new NBA trade machine tool. Uh, we think it's the best on the internet. We want to make sure it's the best on the internet, which means we need feedback. Use it. Break it. Tell us what's great. Tell us what stinks. Use it on your phone. Use it on your computer. Give us the works. At Spotrek on Twitter. Let us know what's good and bad about this thing because we want to make this thing as good as humanly possible. Um, certainly before this February 8th trade deadline, but even throughout the offseason when plenty of trades get done June, July, and August heading into next season as well. So that's our brand new shiny toy that's coming. It's available now. We want it's in beta mode. We want to make it as as good as humanly possible. Please provide us feedback as you can. My NFL off season pieces are live with all these cap clearing possibilities and notable free agents. Like I said, the free agent tracker for the NFL now includes an analysis tab, which where I will be breaking down and slightly ranking <clears throat> potential free agents, including projected contracts for every single one of those players. And I will have plenty more. Deep dives into the extension candidates, right? The Chris Jones, the Jared Goffs, the Brandon Ayukes, some of these fun running back conversations with Henry and Barkley and Josh Jacobs and Tony Pollard and DeAndre Swift. And plenty of weapons like that. Plenty more coming into the Seneville offseason. Enjoy the two weeks leading up to the Super Bowl for Scott Allen. My name is Mike Gennetti. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Spot Trade Podcast. <laughs>